Now, as I was going down the ditch, the ditch kind of narrows down, right? Now, I was right here. I had 16 foot, 16 foot <clears throat> of ditch. And the, and the di engineer gauged it again. He says, he says, Frenchy, we need 17 feet. That's that's what uh, Texaco company corporate office want. They want this pipeline to be buried 17 feet, so so there won't be a, another disaster like that that other other pipeline. They want to make sure it's deep enough so nobody would uh, a fishing boat drag an anchor over it or another spud barge come come in there and grab it. So I had 16 foot. He says, give me one more foot. So I went back back down there. And try to bury that last that last foot. Now the ditch. While I was digging, while I was digging here, the whole the whole side the whole side of the ditch fell on top of me. Now here I was. Uh, here I am at the bottom. This is this is me. Yeah, here I am about it. And I got this whole three ton of mud fell on top of me. Now here's what I was using. The Navy had a, a little what they call a foxhole nozzle. It was built like this. And then your water pressure came out of here. And then over here in the back, they had little little bitty holes and the back pressure would go like that. That's the kind of clean, the clean of the bream. But it was impossible to use it at, at, at this depth of ditch. So what we did, we patented what they call a T nozzle. It's just a bunch of hardware. We had a nipple here, a nipple here where the water would shoot on both sides and would equalize. Then over here, then we, then we had a another, another pipe, uh, another pipe here that could swivel back and forth. And then you, you build, then your water hose would be attached to this. And that's what I was using. This and it's just something like we, uh, we had just been using maybe about six months. We just wanted to try it out. But this was impossible to use this navy old type navy. We use what they call a T nozzle. And I now after I was buried, I had communication. Right? And I had air pressure. <clears throat> they knew I was in, in danger. Now they started to use a drag line to drag to drag the mud, grab the mud and and Pull up, but they were afraid it might be caught on my break my my air hose and my communication hose, and then I would be in a hell of a fix. But anyhow, they called another diver out of New Orleans, a guy named Jay Jones, that I worked several jobs with him before. But he didn't know who who had got buried alive. They just told him a diver a diver was buried buried and needed another diver to unbury him. So finally, when he got on the board, he says, who's down there? They said, French and Colin. He says, oh, my God. He says, I will get him out. I'll get him out. So he did, he did as he's digging with the water, he had the same T-nozzle that I was using. He's using to, to get the mud off of me. So when he got pretty close to me, he didn't know if it was my feet or my head. So he put a lot of pressure, and I started getting water in, in my mass. And I says, oh my God, here I got a chance to get saved and I'm, he's going to drown me. But finally, he got me out. Now, I lost communication. I had air and I lost, I lost communication. So finally, uh, after he unburied me, I, I lost conscious. I don't remember nothing till he got by me. He gave me his hand and I squeezed it. And then they, they got me out and I woke up two days later in the um, Port Sopel Hospital. Now you weren't wearing a dye helmet at this time. You were wearing a mask, just a mask. I was just wearing a mask on this little there. The whole, the bottom, um, this top of the water, is is the bottom. It was only about maybe maybe fifteen feet of water. Now, is is the pipeline? Then I had to go seventeen feet down below. Uh, the bottom of the desk, yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. I was just using the, the regular what they call a desco mask. Then about a year, I mean a, a month later, I met the engineer, you know, and, 
And he gave me a he gave me a hug and said, Frank, you okay? I said, Yeah. I said, but first of all, he I says, you, you did get your 17 feet, right? And that's what I gave you. But it all co almost cost my life. You know, and he apologized and everything, but that's okay. It's all it's history now. Yeah. So that's that's what happened on this on this uh, on this particular job for, for Texaco. Yeah. Is there any any other question we'd like to know? Not on this one. In 1973, I had a job out of uh, North Africa in Libya. We were laying a <clears throat> a 24 inch pipeline and was going to tie in to another existing line that was already been laid for, for a couple of years. When we came to the pipeline, we had to remove a flange of the existing pipeline so we can tie the other pipeline in. So I can't recall his name right now. So he's a Canadian diver and a hell of a diver and a hell of a good friend of mine. Uh, he went down first. His job was to take take the flange off with an air impact, take the flange off so we can put attach the other pipeline to it. The pipeline was supposed to have been flooded at that time. That's what we were told. But we found out later on the pipeline wasn't flooded. So they still had uh, you know, some pressure on it. So what we done, he went down there and took the flange off and couldn't move it after he removed all the bolts and nuts on it. He could not move it. So what he done, he had a little sledgehammer and he kind of tapped it a little bit. Then he had a 15 inch crescent to pry it open up a little bit. Well, as soon as he put that 15 inch wrench, it just sucked it right out of, out of his hand. So this says, oh my God. So what he done, he should have stopped right now. But not knowing what was going on, he decided to take his foot and move the, with his right foot and remove the flange and press with his left foot, you know. And when he did, he, he moved it a little bit, but then he cut himself on the foot and then he couldn't remove his foot up because the suction, the suction had him. And he hollered for help. So I was the next diver standing by. So I went, when I went down there, I didn't know what situation he was in. So when I went, I got to the bottom, we're in about 70, 80 feet of water. When I got down to the bottom, I could see it, I could see his foot inside, halfway inside the pipe. And he was pointing, he was pointing to me. So what I tried to do is get his shoulders, get my arm around his shoulder and his back, and he's using his left foot to pull himself out and he, he wouldn't budge. And finally, I let, I let Topside know what was going on, and they was gonna try to send another diver down there. But the time they sent another diver, what happened with the suction had sucked all his blood out. I was looking him right in the eye and seeing him turn, you know, uh, white as a sheet in front of my eyes. And I had to let Topside know what was going on, that he was, you know, then he was dead. He got the blood sucked out of him. And I says, oh my God. So what I had to do, the water kept coming in, the water kept coming in. So we were down there for about 25, 30 minutes till the water gets in the pipe and equalizes. And then I pulled him up and then we brought him, we brought him topside. And then they picked him up with a helicopter and took him on the beach. And I believe they brought him to Tripoli at the hospital, but he was already deceased. Yeah, that was one incident that uh, you know stays with me, you know. How big a pipe was this? How big a hole was it that that sucked the blood right out of this gentleman? Well, one was uh, the two, no, this was a thirty-inch pipeline, and we, and we coming in with a a twenty-four pipeline, the existing pipeline. It was a kind of a a tie-in, you know. But they had a flange on it for future use, mm -hmm. and we did, yeah. But what was bad about it? They had already reported that the line should have been flooded. There was no, been no problem. He took that flange off, and then we'd have came up with that other flange and uh, attached the other existing pipeline and then tightened it up. Now, that was all there was to that, that project. But being the pipeline was dry and 90, 80, 90 feet of water, 
it's got, got a hell of a suction. And that's what happened, and he tried to kick it. He shouldn't have kicked it with his foot. He should have just came out. At least he had an opening. He should have came out and maybe a couple hours or more, maybe the pipeline would have been, you know, filled up, and then he could have went back down there and finished the job. But it, it just didn't happen that way. Yeah. yeah, so that was that was a sad situation. Seeing a man bleed to death in front of you. Now you had another gentleman that you knew about, Daniel Boone. Yeah, well, yeah, that was another incident. This was happening um, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Daniel Boone was a diver. We were uh, we were using the sat saturation unit at that time. We were using mixed gas, oxygen, helium. Well, Danny had just finished a dive, and um, then he had changed clothes and everything, got something to eat, and we got a we got a bathroom there. He decided he had to use the bathroom. Now, when you use the bathroom, when you finish, you open the valve, and it goes into another septic tank. And then you tell, you tell the, uh, the tender outside that's uh, operating the valve and flushing the commode to tell them, go ahead and open the valve, because your valve was already open. And, uh, but the last one, last diver that used the bathroom, the tender had went through the regular operation, but the guy had opened up the valve and something might have distracted him. He didn't close the valve. He left it open. So when Daniel Boone went to use the bathroom and he opened his valve you know, to flush the commode, well, it sucked up all, all his intestine completely out. So we had, to, and he still had about maybe a day or so decompression. It's a slow decompression on that unit. It's four feet an hour. So finally, we had to get two doctors, two doctors, a regular doctor, Dr. Doctor, Dr. Workman, and another doctor out of LSU Medical. They have never been in a chamber. They flew them down the offshore in a chopper, and uh, we pushed them in the chamber and, re and uh, decompressed them and then they went to the other main chamber to take care of Daniel Bone. But they didn't know what to do. Uh, so they took the two bunks and made an operation table up there. And they were there for about an hour trying to, trying to shove some of his intestine back. And, and of some of them was already gone. They flushed out the commode. So that was then finally, after they went there, kind of had him stabilized, then finally we had to decompress him, the two doctors and Daniel Bone. And um, after that, well, then they, uh, they got a chopper but off the beach, feet? and then um, they took him to the hospital. But how many feet underwater were you guys at this time when, 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 when this happened? How, about how many feet of underwater were you? Well, we were, uh, well, we, he's in the dry chamber. We were diving, I believe, uh, either eight or 900 feet with saturation. We had about, I think about a week. We were, we were there about a week trying to finish that job, working around the clock, two, seven days. A two twelve hour shift, you know, and um, he came out of the hospital all right. He had a private nurse follow him around. No, um, for for about three months, she followed him around. Of course, he loved horses. He bought him a bunch of thoroughbred horses, mm -hmm. and um, last time I seen him, he was nothing but skin and bone, because he couldn't keep anything in his stomach. He'd go right through him. And as far as bowel movement, uh, he didn't have any, it went right through him. So that's why that had that nurse uh, with him 24 hours a day. And about three years later, um, then I heard, I heard he had passed away. Um, but that's, that's the two real good friend of mine, that real, real tragedy that, that happened. How many divers? And it should not, and it should not happen. Yeah. Yeah. How many divers have you, uh, uh, do you know from the beginning, from when you first started diving, that are that are still around today? Well, personally, the, I lost 17 divers that I worked side by side for several several years. As of today, uh, December the 6th, 2009, uh, there might be three or four left from the 1950, you know, 55, 56 game. There's very few commercial divers that I know alive today, you know, 
of course, at, at my age, 82 going on 83, there isn't, there isn't that many of us. And some of them I, I, I can't even trace, find out where, where they're at, if they're still alive or, or deceased, you know what I mean? Well, I, might, I might be the only one alive, who knows? <laughs> you know. Now you were diving once in Mexico, right? And there was a, you guys were putting in a well or filling in a well? Yeah, that, um, that particular job was, um, I believe one of the stu uh, structure had been damaged to a, to a hurricane or something. When you say structure, that's like an the, oil the, the rig. The drilling platform. Yeah. And um, uh, they wanted the platform out of the way, but before that, they had to kill the well, right? So finally, uh, they needed some divers down there to uh, put charges or something, you know, to blow it out or cap it. And Lil Anderson, he was a young kid. He was only about 23, 24 years old. He'd been diving for about two or three years, but kind of a gung-ho gung -ho type of diver. That's not he wouldn't try. And uh, finally, the well blew up. I don't forgot how much pressure they have. But all that, all that gas pressure was hitting the surface, and we were in 120 feet of water, 110 feet at that time. They had so much pressure that on top of the, top of the sea, uh, it was nothing but, a, you know, like a, oh, what I was going to say, like, like a, a whirlpool. Well, like a whirlpool, yeah, a spa whirlpool type of deal. That's how, that's, that's how strong it was. Somehow he was supposed to go over there and con disconnect or connect something. I, don't, I forgot a cable or something. And uh, he got too close, he got too close to it and they just blew him all the way to the top. I killed him on, on impact. Yeah, and that was another tragedy, you know. And they always said why, he knew the danger there, but why did he get so close or there might have been a mishap or something, who, who knows. So what do you think kept you alive so, many, so long and, and kept you from being in the same situations that these other guys have been in? Oh, I'm, I'm too mean to die. <laughs> you, know, I mean, you know, I'm too bad. I'm, you know, I guess the good Lord's got a, got a reason to keep me alive, you know. There wasn't anything that you did special that anybody no, else? No. Or... I mean, I had a few close calls, but I'm... But you did things smart, or you were just safe, or just lucky? Oh yeah, well, um, I, knew, I knew my trade. <laughs> <laughs> I knew my business, and I, and I, and I knew the danger of, of the, the situation. And that's several times to 25 years of diving, and I got on the sea bottom, and I, and I thought to myself, what the hell am I doing here, you know? Well, my, well, my working a construction job or something. But I love the business. It wasn't a job. It was a way of life, and I love it. <laughs> and I would do it today if I if I was able to. So what made you leave? Well, after um, after a certain age, uh, insurance won't insure you. So after I quit diving, I. Um, I went as a diving instructor. I trained over 100 some odd guys. You just quit with, on your own? You just decided I'm going to quit this? And not do no, no. Um, like I said, after I did the training, and uh, and I guess it was just time to, for me to. The insurance get out. company didn't have anything yeah, to do no, with it. No, it wouldn't insure me as a diver. Because I, but I, I stayed there for three years later, later after I retired. How old were you? Huh? How old were you? Oh my God, I'm, I'm 82, it's 30. Oh, I was uh, about 50, 57, 59, something like that in that age when I quit. And I wrote, when I left, I was the last one out of the original six with Taylor Diver that, that retired. I was the last one. And I wrote in my, di my diary, I shall work here no more forever. And I closed the book and went look for some other. What happened to Taylor? Taylor Diving. Well, the Taylor before. Capital One, they, they, they resold the company. Uh, it's been sold twice. Uh, right now, last time I went up there about four or five years ago in New Orleans, uh, the place is abandoned. You know, and it's a shame. Um, of course, the diving company, the diving uh, industry is not as big as it was back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you know. but. Who bought it first? After Taylor had it, then who bought it next? What? Bought Taylor, the the diamond um, company. The first, first, yeah. 
The first one, it was an English company called uh, uh, 2W. They had it for three, three or four years, and then they sold it to another company, which I don't rec recollect right now. They sold it to another company, mm -hmm. and they left it, and nobody bought the building. Halliburton never but took all, over you know, or never bought it or they, anything? They still got the, um, excuse me, they still got the uh, the million dollar uh, hydrobaric chamber still attached to the building, but the building was all abandoned and everything. Sad, sad. <laughs> so Halliburton had never bought that, had never no. bought Taylor? No. 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 Brown and, Brown and Rue just sold that, that part and, and they used another diamond company. Okay. Yeah. They Let's take a break. Rolling and speed. Now, Frenchie, you worked a lot with explosives. Just tell me a little bit about uh, about how you started working with explosives, please. Okay, we're going on explosives. Yeah, I just want to know du about the explosives. DuPont, plus that, what we did um, before we got on camera, we laid a uh, they had two pipelines coming into the beach, right? Uh -huh. And the beach is at solid rock, right? Mm -hmm. And where so, was this at? So the barge can only go oh. so far if it don't it hit the ground. Yeah. So what they do, they stay over there. As they weld the pipe, they push it and push another joint and then push it and push it. But they can't do as the beach. So what they had to do, we had to dig a ditch. It had to be, uh, I believe it was 80 foot wide and at least... 10 to 12 foot deep. And where is this at? Now, and us in Persian Gulf. Okay. Yeah, in other words, we had to build a ditch before the pipe, the, the barge is still laying pipe and it's coming towards us. We had oh, to okay. dig that ditch, 80 foot wide, and I believe it was uh, 21 or 2200 feet long. It had to be eight foot, eight to 12 foot deep, but anyhow, to support them two pipe side by side, and then they'd hook them up and go to the refinery. So, to to dig that ditch, I mean it's it's, it's like granite. They even try they even try to uh, knock it down with a jackhammer and mm -hmm. then pick it up pieces by pieces. They said no. The best way to do is use dynamite. Mm -hmm. You know, we I was using uh, nitroglycerin and TNT mix in sausage. You know, in by sausage. The, by the truckload. Well, it's. It's like a sauce, it's a big, big plastic bag, it's about that big, it weighs about 40 pounds. Oh. That was uh, the TNT and then we had the nice nitroglycerin. And then we'd pour, we'd mix them together and pour them in a canister with, uh, with a square cement to hold them at the bottom of the ditch so they won't be floating. Mm -hmm. And then we'd rig up all our primer cord. I set up, oh, it takes two, three days just to fill them all up and mix it up. And then we put all the canister in one line. And then we pulled the other line. We pulled maybe four, five hundred feet at a time, mm -hmm. you know. And 7,000 7, feet of, uh, I mean, 7,000 pounds of dynamite at one lick. So we get, uh, we, we'd string everything on the water. I had full five Arab work with me, me and Neil Landry. And right before we shoot, we call the airport. We don't want to shoot while the plane's coming into the airport. We weren't far from the air, the little airport there. Yeah. So they can warn the airport not to fly over that area because we've been shooting because that water go about a couple hundred feet up in the air. Mm -hmm. So we'd back up about maybe six, seven hundred feet. And then we had a shield that we had, oh, we could look at it. Then we'd run our primer cord and, our, and put our cap on it and reel our reel. Then we'd pull it to plug. Then we'd say, okay, we're clear. <clears throat> and we've been in water, fish, and everything go up in the air. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then the drag line would come in and dig all that debris out and just build, build like a road, like a levee on that. As we go, they'd build a road, the drag line could go, because we had to go 2,000 feet out. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then after all that cleared, they would dig for a day or two, clear it up, and then some, and then they, then we'd measure how, how deep it is. Let's say it only blew three or four feet. Okay, well, we need another another four feet. So we give it a double shot till they get the rot. And then they do the same thing process until we got, you know. Until you got enough. Now, yeah. how'd you learn about explosives, though? I mean, well, I worked for, I went two weeks in, um, I worked for Lane Wells Company. We do a um, logging and um, exploration for the oil field. And, um, 
the company sent me two weeks, two weeks at the DuPont uh, training school, learning about blasting cap and dynamite and, and everything else, and primer cord and everything. So, um, so I had two weeks there because that's normally eighty percent of the what we laid well. That's what we done. Perforated all wells. We either jet comb or with bullets or with primer cord and everything. So I had that. When I went before I went in the diving business, I had that kind of background experience going for me. And as poor being the senior diver, so when they had a diving uh, blasting job for diving, they said, well, hey, get French, he's got experience. So through the years, I, I, did, all, I did all the blasting for the company. Of course, a lot of divers, they don't know part of it, <laughs> you know. So that's, that's what, what happened. So who's some of the most interesting people you've ever worked with? I mean, as far as you find, I find interesting, none of them, some of them, one. Well, um, what was his name? Uh, he was the his daddy was the um, shy of Baran. You know? See the one that gave you the knife? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, his his son is um, Elizan. You know, not direct, it comes from the ladies on. Mm -hmm. They shake that do it direct, well that's a ceremony, they get it, they go to another person to give it this person, you know. Um, shake ours, what is it, um, I still got the portrait in my, uh, my diving room. Uh, eyes of men, shake eyes of men, something. But anyhow, but he had another name, that was it, that. His daddy passed away and he took over the Isle of Moran. He was 36 years old, educated in New Orleans, spoke better, <laughs> he spoke better English than I do, of course, more education than I was, but he took a liking to, um, to the divers. We used to go up there and play poker. <laughs> we played poker, uh, you know, but there was no, um, if they wanted something to drink, uh, it was Pepsi Cola. Or ice cream. <laughs> there was no liquid up, but we go play, and he wear regular, regular street clothes. You know, the Baran. You know, he only wore the, the deal for ceremonial purpose, and he took a lot. We we knew him for two or three years. He was very interesting. But if you speak or spoke to him, you wouldn't think he was the, you know, the Sheikh of Baran. Baran's a little island, but they got a lot of oil field, so he inherited the. Uh, the position from his daddy, but if you talk to him person to person, and uh, you wouldn't even think he was the he was the uh, the Sheikh of Bahrain. He was just a, a normal. You, you think it was a. I looked him at it as a businessman more than a than a, than a, than a Sheikh, and yeah, that's what he got. But he he liked all of us. We didn't get intimate personal, but you know we talk, and you want to know about the diving person. business and blah blah blah. And we learned a lot from him about his daddy and what it was uh, back in the twenties and thirties. In fact, the old um, the whole Sheikh uh, Palace was built, and the other one was made out of wood. It was pretty huge, and they uh, they made a for the Baranian kids. They made.